Hi there, I'm Craig Chapman, Software Consultant for Embarcadero Technologies. Welcome to this skill sprint on building RESTful services using Delphi. My email address and Twitter handle are on the screen and will be again at the end of the presentation. At the bottom of the slide you can see a link to the blog post which accompanies this skill sprint. This skill sprint works with Windows, OS X, Android and iOS for both the client and server side applications. We're also going to take a look at how to convert the service application into an Azapi plugin for Microsoft's IIS, which of course will be for Windows only. The same technique can be used to convert the service into other formats, such as an Apache plugin, for example. The skill sprint is relevant to RAD Studio Delphi and C++ Builder, and as you're watching the Delphi skill sprint, the code will be written in Object Pascal. For the C++ version, you can join us again on Thursday. We're going to build a REST JSON service which runs over HTTP. We'll take a very brief look at what REST and JSON are, and for more information on each, you'll find links on the blog post. We'll then look at how to start the server project in such a way that you can choose to build either a standalone application or an ISAPI module, or perhaps an Apache module or other. We'll then create the methods of CRUD, create, read, update, and delete. And we'll end the skill sprint with some Q&A time. So REST, or representational state transfer, is an architectural style which shapes your application. Saying that an application is RESTful is something like saying it's an N-tier application or a client-server model. It describes the shape of the application, but it doesn't fill in the details, such as which protocols are used. Today we're going to use JSON over HTTP, but we could just as soon create a RESTful service which uses XML and SOAP, or which runs over TCP directly. Making an application RESTful imposes several constraints on the design, including that the service must be stateless and therefore doesn't maintain information such as a session. Uh, the service should also have a uniform interface, meaning that the client doesn't necessarily have to know which APIs or resources are available on the server, it can discover these. The exception to that is known fixed endpoints. And what we're going to build today will have a single endpoint. Typical implementations of REST over HTTP employ a CRUD-like system for manipulating data. We'll use the four verbs from the HTTP protocol, get, put, post, and delete, to represent the various CRUD methods. Now let's take a look at JSON. JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation and was originally derived from the JavaScript scripting language. Being a language agnostic format, JSON is now used by a wide range of programming languages as a means of encapsulating data in a readable format. JSON primarily consists of a series of comma-separated name-value pairs, which may be grouped with braces to form objects and may also be grouped with brackets to form arrays. JSON is also recursive in that any object can own any other object and may own values and arrays also. Here's a piece of example JSON taken from the Wikipedia page. You can see the name value pairs and you'll notice that the fields of the address are encapsulated with braces making this an address object. Similarly the phone numbers are encapsulated with brackets and each of the elements inside that bracket is enclosed in braces. So the phone number's array is an array of phone number type objects. So let's go ahead and start building our server. Okay, so here we are in RAD Studio, and I'm going to go ahead and get started with a new project. I'm going to select Other, and then I'm going to come down to Web Broker and pick a Web Broker server application. I've got several options here. I'm going to stick with the standalone application. Uh, since this is a server and I'm only going to be running it on Windows, I'm going to choose VCL. Hit test port, make sure the port's functioning correctly, and hit finish. So RAN Studio has created this project for me. I'm going to go ahead and save everything off. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create, um, let's make a, an employees 
directory, and within that I want to have this is the server application, so I'm going to create a server directory. And then I like to break the source code down uh, into forms and modules. Okay, and the file that we're saving right now is the main form, so let's go into forms, and this will be form main. Now we're being asked if we want to save the web module, so I'm going to come up and into modules, and I'll save this one as mod main. Okay, and now I'm being asked to save the project. Now because this is the standalone project, I'm going to call this employee stand alone and save that in the server directory. So now I actually have a uh, server service ready to run. Let's go ahead and take a look at what this looks like when we run it. So this is the main form of the application. It's just got a button to start the server, another to stop the server, and if I click on open browser, it's going to take me into, uh, I think Chrome is my default. Uh, what we can see here is that the server is running on local host and on port 8080, and it's returning web server application as the uh, content for the default request. Okay, so let's stop the server now and go take a look at the source. Now the, the main form, I don't really need to do anything to change this form. Uh, what I'm going to do is put my code in the module. So looking at mod main, uh, what we have is a list of actions for this module. Let's go and take a look at those actions. And at the moment we have only one, which is the default handler, and path info being uh, slash or root for the web server. And oops, if I click on that action and go take a look at its handler, we can see that it spits out this web server application in a piece of HTML, and that's what we saw before. So let's take a look at the parameters that we have here. We've got the request, which is a T web request, uh, response, and handled. Now the request is going to contain the uh, content of the HTTP request, as well as any parameters. It'll tell you which method was used when calling and so on. Response is where we're going to put our reply. So you can see here we've got response.content and it's spitting out the web server application code. And then handled, it's actually set to true by default, uh, but this indicates whether or not this handler handled the request. So if we were to put false in here, the application would know that this handler didn't handle the request. And the reason that's important is when we add a new action, if the new action doesn't handle the request, then it will fall back to the default handler, which is this one. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's add a new action to this web module. Actions and item. And you can see we've now got web action item one. I'm going to go ahead and rename this to ACT employees. And this is actually going to be the end point that allows me to manipulate the employee's data table. So what I'm going to do is under path info, I'm going to put slash employee or employees. It's not the default handler, that would be this one, uh, and it is enabled. So we'll go ahead and put some content in the on action event handler. For the moment, what I'm going to do is put in response.content equals employees. So I'm going to go ahead and run this uh, application. Let's save it off again. And let's see how we access that endpoint. So by default, we've opened the browser up to the root, which is why we're still seeing web server application. But if I put in slash employees, then I get this employees data back. So that demonstrates my uh, endpoint working. Now, before I go on and start building a client to work with this server, I'm actually going to show you how to build the Zappy module. So I'm going to select Add New Project. I'm again going to go for a web broker, web server application. And this time I'm going to select Zappy Dynamic Link Library. 
click on next. I'm going to leave it with the VCL since it's a Zappy, it's Windows only. And it's created this new project for me. Now, web module unit one here is the default module. I'm going to go ahead and remove that. And then instead, I'm going to add mod main from the standalone service. Okay, so now when I build this project, it's going to contain the same module code as the standalone. So whatever changes I make up in the standalone application, so long as they're to the module, uh, will be reflected in the ISAPI. Let's go ahead and save that project off. So we have project one. I'm going to call this employees. And I'm now being asked to save the project group as well. So let's call that group employees. Okay, so now if I go ahead and hit build all, we're going to build both the standalone and the Osapi, which we can find under the project directory in, uh, let's see here, Win32, debug, because we're in the debug profile, we have our standalone and the Osapi form of the same project. Interestingly, uh, by default, IIS servers only run 64-bit applications. You can configure them to run 32, but we're going to go ahead and add the Win64 platform to this project and make sure it's the default. And then when we build that, we have a Win64 directory with our 64-bit version. Let's go ahead and start uh, one more application. Add new project. And this time I'm going to go for a multi-device application. So this is an FMX application that will run on mobile and desktop targets. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and save this project under employees. I'll create a new directory called client. This is for the client application. And then under the client application, uh, I'm going to have a forms directory. And I'm going to get it, save this form as form main again, because it's a different application and in a different directory, so that's not going to cause any conflict. And then I'm going to call this project employee uh, employees client. Okay. Now in the client application, uh, we can make use of the REST client class, T-REST client. And then we also have the REST request class and REST response. Let's take a look at each of these. So the REST client component, I'm going to take the little uh, one off of its name there. So the REST client component is your HTTP client. And in order to use this, all we really need to do is set the base URL, HTTP, localhost, 8080. So that's where the service we have is running. The REST request component, again, I'm going to take a little one off its name there. Uh, this one is, uh, it represents a HTTP request. So you can see that this would be a GET request. We can use delete post per. Uh, what you need to do with this one is make sure that it's pointing at the correct response component and that it's pointing at the correct uh, REST client. So the REST response Again, it represents the HTTP response from the server. So as long as these are all bound together correctly, what we should be able to do is put a resource in here of slash employees. So we've got the correct endpoint. And I should be able to go ahead and hit execute. Oh, I need the service to be running first. So let's go ahead and start that up. Okay, now hit on the client to hit execute here, and I get response 200 okay. And what's happened is the request 
for the employee's endpoint was made through the REST client and the response that we got back has been stored in this REST response class. If I go and take a look under the content property, I can see I've got 13 bytes and it's the uh, employee's tag that we sent back from the server application. Okay, so now back up on the server application, if I go and take a look at my module again, sending this tag back by itself is not incredibly useful. Well, thankfully, because we're working within a module here, we can go and take a connection to a database. So I'm going to go and grab, as you might have guessed, the uh, standard interbase sample database, and I'm going to take the employee table. If I drag that over onto my mod main, then I get a connection component, and I'm going to rename that to com so that I can save myself a bit of typing. And I hit connected true. So I'm now connected to the database. I've also got this employee table, which is actually a TFD query component. So I'm going to go ahead and change the name of this one to QRY again to save myself some typing. So I now have access to some data on the server. Let's look at how we can send that data back. So the first thing that I need to do is to modify this method. I'm going to take out the, uh, the little holding place code that we had in there and I'm going to do a little bit of cut and paste here. I'm going to paste in this case statement. So we're going to set handle to true and then based on the requested method whether it's a get, put, post or delete we're going to call our own get, put, post and delete methods and if we get anything else uh, we'll return a 400 which just says that this is a bad uh, request. So let's uh, start fleshing out those methods. So the method that we care about at the moment is going to be get. This is our read, and we're going to read some data out of the database and send it back to the client. So again, I'm going to work with some, uh, here's one I made earlier code. And let's take a look at what we're building here. So first thing that we have is the JSON array. Well, in order to use that, I'm going to need the system.json namespace. Uh, so this class represents an array of objects or an array of values in JSON. We also have the JSON object, which represents an object in JSON. I'm doing a little check here for uh, query fields, and if we have a min and max, then my SQL is going to request everything from employee where the employee number is between my min and max values. Alternatively, if we don't have any parameters, I'm just going to select everything from employee. I then activate that query by setting its active property to true. And assuming it remains true, I'm then going to check that we get some records back from the database. And if we do, I'm going to create an array to return those records. I'm then going to loop through. So I'm going to query dot first to get the first record. And while we're not at the end of that uh, end of file, end of uh, those records, I'm going to build an object, and I'm going to take each of the, uh, the query fields here and feed it into a uh, JSON pair, which will be inserted into the JSON object. So we're going to send in the employee number, first name, last name, phone, uh, hire date, and so on. At the end here, I'm adding that object that I've built into the array, which is a uh, JSON array object here. And then finally, I'm calling query next to get the next record. And when we've looped through all of them, I'm going to set my response content type to application slash JSON so that the client knows that the data is in the JSON format and that's what it needs to pass. And then I'm going to set the content as a dot to string. So that's the JSON array being translated into a string. So if I go ahead and save and build that project now. Oh, 
Ah, the uh, standalone server is still running, so let's go ahead and try that once more. Okay, so I now have a running server with at least the get method implemented. If I come over to my client application, under the rest request, I'm going to hit execute again. I get a 200 OK. And if we go take a look at the response data, where is it? Content. You can see now that I have all of the records from the employee sample database being populated as JSON data. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to place you on hold for a moment while I spin ahead and flesh out this uh, client and server application. Okay, so I fleshed out this application a little. Uh, we've got a field for each of the uh, values that we're getting back from the JSON uh, data. I've got buttons for read, create, edit, and delete methods. So that's our CRUD methods. Uh, I have previous, next, first, and last, so I can browse uh, multiple records when I get them back. Create has a commit button to commit the data once I've created it, and edit has an update button. Again, it's kind of uh, the same as the commit, really, is committing the changes back to the database. Uh, the first thing we should take a look at is uh, how I've implemented these buttons. So I actually have here uh, global members on the class. So I've got a JSON array. And when I read data from the endpoint, uh, it's going to populate that array. And then I have a current index, which tells me which entry within the, the array I'm looking at. I've uh, then implemented uh, this JSON to form method. So we're going to take a look at that. All I'm doing is copying from that array, whichever index I have currently selected, copying those values into the edit boxes. I've also got a clear form, which just clears the boxes out. So we were looking before at the read method. If we're going to take a look now. What I've done here is I've set up uh, the rest resource to uh, point to the employee's endpoint. Uh, I'm doing this because at other places in the application I might want to add additional endpoints on that service. I'm setting the method and in our CRUD setup the, the re read method is based on the HTTP GET, so I'm using a HTTP GET. Uh, and I'm making sure that the response class is bound to my request. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to clear out the request parameters and I'm going to add in a min and a max. And these are based on these two edit boxes at the top of the screen here, min and max. I go ahead and execute the request. Uh, that's going to go off to the server, make the call, and it's going to come back with an array of data. So I'm going to make sure that my global JSON array is nil and disposed. Uh, and then I'm going to call tjson object dot parse json value, and I'm going to pass in the content that I get back from my HTTP request. So what's going to happen here is it's going to parse that JSON data and return it as uh, a JSON object, which is actually a base class. So I'm casting that as a tjson array, and that gives me my array of records. And then I'm using current index. Uh, setting it to zero so that I get the first record and calling the JSON to form method which is going to load that data onto my form. Before we run that method, uh, let's just take a look at one or two of these buttons. So previous just decrements the index and calls JSON to form again. And as you can imagine, next increments the index, first sets the index to zero, and last sets the index to the last record in the array. And if I go ahead and run this application, I'm going to set as a parameter, say 10,000, so basically we'll get all of the results from the database. I'm going to hit read, and you can see that data has been populated. I can use next, 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 previous, previous, first, and last to navigate the data. OK, so the next method that I've implemented is the create method for creating new records. Now, in doing this, all I'm actually doing when you click the button is clearing the JSON data from the form and then calling this create mode method. Now, what create mode does is it just sets a bunch of these uh, edit boxes read only to false, uh, sets the text prompts, and sets the font colors for each of them. 
So what that's doing is it's just making sure that the, uh, the form updates in such a way that it looks like I should be entering data. I've also added an edit mode and a browse mode. Browse mode puts us back into the mode we're currently in, where the text is black and we're able to browse the data. And edit mode will be used later by the edit uh, CRUD method. So let's go ahead and take a look now at what happens when we create a record. Well, it's going to make this uh, commit button is going to enable it so that I'll be able to commit the changes that I put in back to the database. If I go and take a look at the commit button, I'm setting up my REST request to point to the employee's uh, endpoint again. This time I'm using the POST HTTP method and again I'm binding my response so that I can get some data back. I'm then going to clear the request body so basically, this is the, uh, the HTTP content that we're going to send to the server. And I'm using uh, the JSON writer property of that body to start an object and to insert the columns for first name, last name, phone number, and so on. And for each of them, I'm inserting the value from my edit box. When I'm done with all of that, I uh, write the end of the JSON object. I'm setting this to browse mode perhaps a bit early, but I make the uh, HTTP request, which sends that object up to the server with the post method. The server is then going to create that record in the database, and in doing so, it will generate a new employee ID, and that's what I'm using as my primary key here. So what I'm then going to do is clear out the JSON array on this form and pass the response. Now, the response will be the same object sent back to me with that new UID. Then I'm going to set the index to zero because in uh, theory I should only get a single record come back and I want to be set on that first one and then I'm going to display that record on my form. And before I uh, run that let's go ahead and see what that looks like on the server. So in my module I've actually implemented all of the methods at this point so let's go and take a look at the post method. So we're taking a look at the post method here, and what I'm doing is I'm parsing the JSON data that was sent up to the server. That'll be the new record that we created, and storing that as an object, the request object, which I'm holding a reference to here. Then I'm creating an insert statement into the employee table, and for each of the parameters of the insert, I'm passing in values that I get from the JSON request object. Then I execute the SQL to inject that record into the employee table. And what that's going to do is it's going to make use of uh, a generator to create the new employee ID. So I'm then changing my query to request the value of the generator. So I call the value of the generator and store it in new record ID. And then finally, I take the request object and add the uh, employee number to that object. I create an array to put the object into. After inserting the object, I send the array back as a string. So that's what my client is going to parse uh, in order to see the data. Let's go ahead and run that and see how it looks. So before I do anything, I'm going to go ahead and read some data in. And I'm going to go to the last record, and we can see that this is uh, a record from Mark. So I'm going to hit Create and insert my own record. Now the employee table in the interbase database actually has some constraints, so I'm going to use 600 ENG3 and USA, and then for salary uh, I'm going to put in 50,000. When I hit the commit button, I've just sent that data up to the server, and it's actually come back down and entered into the browse mode. So if I go ahead and read all of the data again, and this time hit the last button, you can see now that the last record is my Gray Chapman record. Okay, so we've got two more of the CRUDs to, uh, to take a look at. Uh, let's go ahead and switch back to the form. So the next method we have is edit. Uh, if I go into the edit again, I'm just entering into edit mode, which sets all of the, uh, all of the edit boxes to writable and changes their text color. And when, I'm co when I've completed my edits, I hit update to send that to the, uh, to the uh, servers. 
So here again, we've got REST request and I'm hitting the employee's endpoint. This time it's the HTTP put method. Again, I'm clearing the request body and building up a JSON object, which is the uh, object that I'm going to be altering. Uh, and what's important here is the employee number is actually being put in this time. So this was absent from the create, uh, whoops, from the create method you'll see that I'm not putting the employee number in. And that's because the server is gonna create that number for me with create. But with edit, I'm actually altering uh, a record. So we're gonna create the employee number and then we're doing exactly the same thing. Uh, we're going back into browse mode, we're making the request to the server. It's going to make those changes and as a confirmation, it will send back the same JSON object. So I'm gonna clear out my JSON array and I'm gonna pause the response that I get as an array and set my browsing index back to zero, load that data into my form. So let's go ahead and see that method run. Okay, so I'm going to read a whole bunch of records, go to the last record and here's my records that I'm going to alter this one. So I click on edit and you see the text has gone blue and I'm gonna change my surname from Chapman to blogs. Uh, and then hit update. And as you can see, that's now come back as a uh, successful result. So if again, I read all of the records and hit last, there's Craig as blogs. So let's very quickly go and take a look at how that method works on the server side. Uh, shouldn't be any surprise to you at this point. So we're using the put method as our update. We're requesting the object and what I'm doing here actually is I'm updating all of the fields regardless of whether or not they've changed. So I'm just doing an update statement and setting the first name, last name, and so on, uh, pushing the parameters in from the request object, which I passed here. I execute the SQL. I build a JSON array, and I pass the same request object back into that array as my response back to the client. Now we have one uh, CRUD method left, and that's going to be delete. So let's go and take a look at the delete code, employee delete. Now this one differs from the others in that I'm not going to send a JSON object from the client to the server. Uh, instead, I'm just going to send a parameter. So here I'm saying the request query fields employee number parameter. So that's coming out of this uh, web request. It's not uh, content. I then create a SQL statement, delete from employee, where employee number equals, and I pass in the employee number that I send as a parameter. I execute that query. I've got a, a JSON array that I create, and the JSON array is just going to send back an object that contains nothing more than the employee number that I intended to delete. So that's my confirmation. I'm sending back just the employee number to say I've deleted it. So let's go and take a look at how the client deals with this. And we have the delete button. Now, whichever record I'm on currently is going to be the one that we delete. So I'm going to create this uh, again, point at my employee's endpoint, use the HTTP delete method. I'm going to clear my parameters and add the employee number as a parameter. And that happens to be the employee number of whichever record I currently have loaded. I execute the request clear out my JSON array and parse the response that I get from the server. That response is going to be a JSON object that contains a single field, the employee number of the record that I deleted. So I'll then clear my form and enter browse mode, having sent a message to the user saying I deleted this record. So let's go ahead and run this application and see that happen. Again, I'm going to read all of the records from the database go over to the last one, which is now Craig Blogs, and the employee number is 146 up here. So when I hit delete, deleted record 146, that sent up to the REST server, came back as deleted. Now, that's cleared out the content of the form, but my parameters are still set, so if I hit read and go to the last record, we're now back to mark because I've deleted that record. Here are some additional links, the first of which is to the blog post that accompanies this skill sprint, where you'll find all of the other links and more information. I've then included a link to my blog where I discuss using the JSON classes 
in both Delphi and C++ Builder. We've then got the Wikipedia links for REST and JSON for some additional reading. We're almost ready to open up for some Q&A, but first, let's listen to a word from Jim on our promotions. Give me a brief moment to tell you about this limited time special offer. All 10 Seattle registered users get the bonus pack, which includes the new Object Pascal Handbook by Marco Cantu. This essential language reference is a modern language guide that includes new features of the language and the core runtime library, a must-have for any Delphi developer. Also get the Binder Converter Basic. It handles the heavy lifting when converting existing VCL applications into FireMonkey applications, so you can start taking advantage of multi-device development right away. And the Premium Style Pack includes premium styles for VCL and FireMonkey to make your application look great on every platform. For more information on these special offers, or to find out what the current offers are, please visit www.embarcadero.com slash radoffer. Your next skill sprint will be on using animations and effects on components. The Delphi track will start on the 9th of February and the C++ on the 11th of February, each of which will be at the times listed on the screen. That concludes this skill sprint. Thank you for watching and I'm now going to open up for some Q&A. Okay, and I'm this is David I, and with me is Jim McKee and Craig Chapman. Hello. So, Jim, why don't you go ahead and work with Craig on the on the question log? Okay, Craig. So, great uh, skills, lots of good information here on building REST servers. I thought your explanation of uh, JSON and REST probably one of the best ones I've seen actually. So. Good stuff, thank you. All right, very. Uh, I try to keep it as brief as possible. So, yeah. Um, here's uh, Wilfred said he's looking to deploy a REST server on Azure. So, I told him he's come to the right place because this is exactly we're talking about building REST servers here. Uh, just to add to that, so if you're deploying on Azure, um, I imagine the best way to do that would be to spin up an IIS uh, server uh, and to deploy an API module and in most cases, if you're talking about large-scale scalability, my preference is always to use a web server rather than the standalone because, you know, IIS and Apache are designed and built to be large-scale web servers. So deploying a module into them means you get to take advantage of their scalability and take advantage of the HTTPS offerings on them as well. Yeah, that, that's good advice. That certainly does help the scalability quite a bit. So the question here, if there's an architectural difference between DataSnap and REST servers. Yeah, so there's several differences between DataSnap and uh, REST services, or more specifically uh, web broker modules is what, what I just built. Um, but probably the most poignant difference between the two is that uh, DataSnap is session-based uh, and uses XML for its uh, data en uh, encapsulation. So if you're using a data snap server, typically you have to hold on to a session. If you have spotty internet connectivity, then that could be problematic. Uh, with a web broker REST service, you make a request, you get a response, and then you close the connection, or you, you can close the connection, you could keep it open. Uh, so it's better for environments where the internet might be a little bit, uh, a little bit spotty. Yeah, and now you can do data snap, I know, with REST and session list, but what you're showing here is really, I guess, kind of, you could say, like a lower level. Uh, it doesn't have, so DataSnap gives you a lot of great stuff out of the box for data sets and change management and stuff like that, where this is kind of a lower level uh, option, if you will. Yeah. Does that matter to you? you? Yes, it is. I mean, you uh, with DataSnap, you get a lot more sort of uh, visual and assistance classes and things like that, but what we're doing here is very much uh, at a code level and literally sitting right there on top of HTTP, so you're just building up the response string, uh, which is something that you typically, I mean, you can do in DataSnap, but you typically don't do. I just want to, ch I just want to chime in that DataSnap also has additional choices with project wizards to get you started, uh, TCP, HTTP, 
HTTPS, and there's a separate wizard for a data snap REST server. And as Craig mentioned, you have pre-built support with components in data snap for session management. You can do either a command where you connect and just do something and go away, your client. Um, a session management where it spins up a thread for each connection and you can keep it active. And then there's also server where it's stateless, where your server keeps track of all the clients or middle tiers that are connected to a data snap server. And what Craig was doing here is saying, I'm going to just use the web broker. Uh, you're going to send commands to it. It's going to return whatever you want. In this case, he was returning JSON because REST is HTTP or HTTPS and REST, or JSON, sorry. So, but you can also return XML. I mean, there are servers that return all sorts of different data types. So here he built it, everything up from web broker, data snap, you have a whole set of components for defining your endpoints versus using web actions, which what Craig showed you. Yeah. And just to add to that, when you said you can return XML, HTTP, I mean, I've used web broker services in the past to return binary objects, images, and, and similar things. So you, pretty much any MIME type, you can send any kind of MIME type data. So there a, uh, was a comment here about stability with web broker, or with data snap, I guess, actually. But the, 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 the reference he's making, to is where they tested it with the standalone for server. And as Craig mentioned earlier, definitely want to use the SAPI module because that gives you greater stability and performance. So that's that's true for both web broker and and data snap. So the, the the standalone module like Craig showed really is for testing and development purposes. But then when you deploy into production, you want to go to an SAPI module or an ASAP, uh, Apache module really. Uh, I also noticed a question on. Uh, I guess they're related. So dependencies on Indy and dependencies on OpenSSL. And I believe, um, Jim or David, you can tell me if I'm correct on this, that since XE7, XE8, the backend Indy was replaced with basically the native TCP. Uh, and we removed the OpenSSL dependency in DataSnap2. Is that right? Yeah. As of XE8, the REST client libraries no longer use Indy. They use the native HTTP client libraries, which include the OS's SSL TLS decryption support. So if you're using uh, an Apache or uh, Apache Apache module or a SAPI module on the server and uh, XC8 or 10 Seattle on the client side, there's no Indy at all in the loop. Indy's great, but the native OS is able to scale more and has uh, built-in SSL. So. You know, if, if you're trying to deal with scalability and, and stability, then the going without the Indies gives you good, better performance. So the question is here, if there are plans to abandon OpenSSL, yeah, that's actually been, you no longer have to use OpenSSL because, uh, like I said, if you're using the the REST client library and a SAPI or Apache modules, and there's no Indie, no OpenSSL at all in the stack. So. Uh, I think I'm trying to think if there's any place we still use OpenSSL. I, I don't remember, but we're, we're certainly moving away from that. Only if you use Project India itself. Yeah, if you use Project India itself, then you're using OpenSSL. And I, I, use the I hope HTTP in cloud, data snap, and EMS. And I hope they keep India around because it is, it is nice, has lots of cool features in there, it's very flexible, but. It's nice to have the option to use the uh, native HTTP. So there's a question here. It says, you noticed you're using dispose of instead of free and nil. Is that uh, preferred for JSON objects specifically, or why are you using that? Um, actually, that's more force of habit now. Um, the mobile compilers that come with RAD uh, include automatic reference counting as a memory model. And um, the way that we dispose of objects on the ARC compilers is to use dispose of. Uh, but because that works for the desktop compilers also, uh, it's become a habit. The, the way that I dispose of objects now is dispose of rather than free and nil uh, because it keeps the code compatible across all of the compilers. 
Is this implementation you're doing safe for SQL injection? Um, I did nothing to protect my code against SQL injection. Uh, having said that, um, let me see. So I would, I'm building up objects. I, I would have to say no, I did nothing to protect it. Um, you could very easily put, um, before you build the body of your request, you can pass your string through a, a validator or a check for uh, SQL injection. Uh, and that, that's true on both the client and server side. Uh, but in the demo, I did nothing to uh, avoid SQL injection. So, so you could like, I guess you could do like a uh, inco HTTP encode. No, what would you do? To, how would you val I guess you'd look for uh, single quotes in there. Or what would you do to validate that? Um, well, there's there's a number of techniques. The the main thing to look for is uh, semicolons because with SQL injection, you typically use a semicolon to terminate whatever text going in and then insert your own uh, statement. Um, so tests for that and tests for uh, quotes and double quotes. What I think you could do as well is, um, let me see if I'm thinking straight. Um, I was thinking of encoding as base64, but I don't think that's necessary. So yeah, it's basically just do a, a string check on the, uh, before you send the request, the HTTP request dot body property will give you access to that string and you can go check that for uh, injection techniques. Yeah. If you're not sure it's SQL injection, as uh, XKCD has a great comic called Bobby Tables that you should check out. Is there a wizard that someone can run that will create a REST server around a set of database tables or queries? There isn't. Um, what you can do is, as you saw with the module there, you can drag and drop your queries onto uh, the web module. Uh, so you can certainly use the visual designer to build that part of it up. And what I've done with the code, um, the CRUD methods, my intention for the, one of the reasons I wanted to write them so low level is if you were to take those methods out and put them in a class of your own and simply change the endpoint, uh, then you could, through some, um, some RTTI and the like, you could quite easily create sort of a generic CRUD server class and CRUD client class uh, and then bind those to a query, control, uh, query component. Um, so yeah, there's there's tools you can use, but there's no sort of specific wizard like you would get with DataSnap, for example. Uh, what are the producer and producer content actions used for? Okay, so um, the producer, um, going on my memory now, we have a, a class, a THTTP producer class, um, which is used to generate HTML, uh, and because WebBroker supports uh, generating HTML-based services, uh, that's what it's there for. It wasn't needed here because we're doing JSON. Um, the nice thing about the producer components is you can put a piece of HTML text on your module which has placeholder tags within it and then you simply populate those placeholder tags in code before you send the response. So it's really, really useful for um, templating HTML uh, but not so useful for the, the JSON that we were doing today. Okay. Uh, there's quite a couple questions here about if this would work on Linux, and I know we do have a Linux server on our uh, roadmap for the future, so that's uh, this would work under Linux once the Linux server is available. Is that correct? Uh, yes. So um, certainly as a standalone, at the moment it works as a standalone on all of our supported platforms in. In theory, though I'm not sure I know why you would want to, you could run uh, the server as a standalone on a mobile device. Um, and so that will certainly be possible. And the Apache module I'm expecting to be available when Linux becomes available too. Uh, obviously not the IIS because that's a, a Windows only thing. Um, but it's for confirmation, it's kind of a wait and see. I'm expecting it to be there, uh, but I need to wait and see what comes out of the the R&D. Yeah. And Marco did a skill sprint if people want to go back to, I think it was spring of 2015, uh, he did a skill sprint on how to use Apache modules on Windows, so you can check that out. And for anybody that's eager for Linux, I would recommend uh, upgrade to 10 Seattle, get update subscription because that gives you access to exclusive briefings as well as beta access and stuff like that. So if you want to get on Linux before everybody else, 
update subscription is your key. So, uh, would it be possible to use sessions on the client? I'm not sure I understand the question. So, who wants to? Um, Several people want to keep the connections with specific clients open. DataStep does that by setting lifecycle on the server class to session, and then under right. the cover, DataSnap manages in a separate thread all of the connections until the clients go away. EMS is stateless, so it, you execute commands. I guess you can build your own session management by keeping track of the connection, IP addresses, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Start up threads and save session state. Sure. So, I mean, if what you want to do is keep the TCP session open, uh, the honest answer on the standalone is I don't know. I'd have to go and look into that. Um, on the if you're using uh, IIS or Apache, uh, then by default they actually do keep the uh, the TCP connection uh, open, and would reopen it if there was a fail automatically. It would reopen the uh, the TCP connection. Uh, if you're talking about keeping session variables, uh, well then that's, I mean, it's implement your own at this low level with a uh, web broker. It's, you know, keep a, keep a session token or a UID or something and, and implement your own session there. Okay. And the last question here is, does this work, what version editions does this work in? Is this an enterprise only or does it work also in Pro? Uh, this works in Pro and has Web Brokers been in uh, RAD for a very, very long time. Uh, so it goes back many versions too. It was Delphi 5 or Delphi 6 that we moved Web Broker into the Pro edition. So way back, you're right. Yeah. I remember that actually. I was uh, using Delphi Pro at the time and when they, that moved, I was very, very excited because <laughs> Web Broker is a cool technology and is. Craig just showed us here. You can build REST servers with it, and I was very excited to build a uh, web broker servers with uh, web broker with Delphi with six. There was an add-on for Delphi five that you could purchase, but uh, Delphi six at least. All right. Well, thank you so much, Craig. This was fantastic. Now uh, that link that's available to your website that includes the videos and has the sample source code download as well, correct? Uh, yep, the videos, the slides, and the source code are there. Um, and uh, at some point in the not too distant future, I'm going to put some instructions for installing uh, the Zappy plugin as well on the uh, either on that page or on my blog, and I'll link to it. Yeah, and made a note in the Q&A for everyone. Also on the Developer Skill Sprints landing page, there's a link to the playlist for all the Skill Sprints. And we'll put the replay of the video as well as combining all the Q&A conversations on the end. I think, Craig, your videos are your original recordings, right? Uh, yes, they are, yeah. Okay. So both ways. And I've got Craig's um, page up, and he's put the URL in the, in the chat window for all of you. So in there is the videos that he recorded, and then some links at the end, including a link to source code, zip file, and slides. OK? Fantastic. Uh, Robert says, thanks for the meaty skill sprint, which is, I agree, great great, great to see some good content. Like, love to see all the code you're writing there. It's always, it's always a fine balance between writing boring code and uh, showing what already worked. But I think you did a good job of building things and making it interesting and, and speeding up the parts that were uh, tedious, I guess. So good work. Thank you. Thank you. OK, David I here. And with me on the line is Jim McKeith and Craig Chapman, I think. Yes. So, there you guys are. So there, uh, Ian is sad that you're losing your British accent. <laughs> Sorry, it comes and goes. It's a consequence of having married an American. And living in Texas. That's right. All right. Um, we've got a, a handful of questions here, some of which I'm not sure I fully understood, so that's why I, uh, I didn't respond to them right away. Um, First one, let's go ahead and tackle this. How would you implement ad security on this? 
Uh, security on a on a web broker service um, in the wizard. There's a HTTPS option when you're building a standalone, uh, and that'll build in the HTTPS support. Um, if you're building this, so as I, I said on uh, the session this morning, I'll say it again. If you're building this for a production environment, my advice would be to take uh, to build in a Zappy or an Apache module and to not use the standalone just from a scalability perspective, but also uh, HTTPS can be enabled in the config of your web server, and web servers are, are built for that purpose, and they you know, let the web server do the work it's built for. Um, so you can do that when you uh, install it into your web server. Uh, and Jim, I think, didn't you recently do uh, a blog or a sprint on encryption? Yeah, that was on uh, encryption with um, app tethering. Which, 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 I guess you wouldn't work for this because it wasn't SSL specifically. But yeah, if you want to turn on SSL, that would encrypt the data traveling. If you were doing the SAPI module or the uh, Apache module, then you could also turn on the uh, in, uh, authentication option through the web server to access yeah. that resource. Uh, you could also have your REST, you could have a, a spot where you have to provide a username and password to receive a token and then require that token for all future requests to would be another option or a way to in, in secure this. So there's a few ways you could secure it, um, but probably the best one, and as you, as you said, even if you're, going, if you're going to production, would be to do this as an Apache module or an SAPI module uh, for scalability purposes and then also for security purposes. Yes. So, Jens is asking, why do we pick this web broker client? What if I want to add a small REST server to an existing project? Right, okay. I'm not sure I entirely understand the question. So we're picking web broker as the server as opposed to the client. Uh, and that's just because what that uh, wizard will do is it'll build, in the case of the standalone, it builds the HTTP server into uh, your code. It builds that... Uh, for you. Uh, in the case of an Zappi or an Apache module, of course, the HTTP server is the server itself, and uh, you're just building a module that slots into it. Um, now, if you want to add a REST server to an existing project, um, then you'd ha you'd first have to add, I guess if you wanted to do it over HTTP, you'd first have to add a HTTP client to that project, um, which you could do using the Indie components, I guess. But uh, it, it really depends on what type of project you have already. I mean, is, if it's a, a data snap module, then you can add a, a JSON module to that data snap. Yeah, there's a few ways to tackle that. But yeah, you could, you could totally... Yeah, if you just looked at the project it created by the wizard and took those pieces and put them in an existing project, that seems like that should work. Uh, yeah, you should be able to cut the uh, the HTTP server component out, and I, I believe one of our sample applications is a HTTP server. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, but uh, if it's not, I can certainly go and see if I can dig that up for you. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, why does a data snap REST server doesn't expose the ID HTTP request info and ID HTTP response info in web module actions instead of web request and web response. Why don't you get the underlying indie objects instead of the abstracted web request and web response objects? Uh, well, in this, in the case of uh, the web broker application that we were just building, that's because um, we're not using indie at all, uh, which is now true of data snap applications also. I, I, I imagine, you know, I'm second guessing the uh, the design here, but I imagine that the reason for that is because uh, it gives you the option to replace India with another technology, which is exactly what uh, Embarcadero have done. So, yeah, yep, yeah, that's the advantage of having that layer of abstraction there. Lots of comments, a great presentation, lots of good information here. I agree, this is awesome stuff here. Uh, in Delphi, we can use the JSON or tjson.object to json string? Or can we use tjson.object to json string? Or is there an overloaded, or the other overload, tjson object to json object? Uh, why doesn't this work in C++ Builder? 
That's a good question. I mean, I don't, I've, I don't actually use either of those methods. I build the objects manually. Um, why it doesn't work in C++ Builder, I, I couldn't tell you. I don't know if David or Jim, if you have any idea on that. I'm not sure. Yeah, if, it, if, it, if it seems to be a bug, you can post it to quality.marketerror.com. Um, I'd have to look at that. I don't know. I'm not sure offhand. Uh, why does T Web Request only have a content property instead of a post stream like ID HTTP request info? Okay. Well, I imagine um, the most likely answer to this is that with the REST server, it's there's nothing that says that you can't send binary data. It's just not typically done as a standard thing. You don't tend to send binary data in these services. It's more often and most usually uh, JSON text data. Uh, and for that reason, there's little call to actually stream something. You know, you're not sending something that's so large that you'd want to stream it in chunks. Um, although, of course, you, you could opt to do that, but you'd, yeah, these classes have not been written that way. Uh, so I imagine it's just because the the uh, idea behind RESTful JSON services is that you get small chunks of data as opposed to very, very large. And that just makes sense for uh, the applications where it's used uh, tend to be, you know, if you're reporting on a screen, you don't necessarily want thousands of records. You want 10 or 12 records to display on the screen. Uh, so because it came out of the web technologies, I imagine that's why that is. Okay. Here's a question about uh, compression. Now that could be a, if you're probably the best way to do that would be through an Apache or IIS module and have it turn on a server level, right? Uh, yeah, I mean again, if you're using uh, JSON, then um, JSON doesn't really allow you to send binary data. So if you're using JSON as the encapsulating format, um, then you would typically to send binary data, you'd base 64 encode it and stuff it into an array. Uh, now, Base64 encoding is going to make it larger, not shorter, so in terms of compression, that's not really going to help. Um, if you want to compress the HTTP traffic, then yes, go for a module which plugs into a server and configure your server to do that for you. And I think there probably is a plugin for the Indie HTTP server to do compression. Um, I know there was on the client side, but yeah, I'm not positive on that. So. But probably the best way is to do, like you said, the, the Apache and the SAPI modules. Yeah, so um, just to clarify on that, I mean, the, the purpose of the standalone, the standalone can be run as a standalone application, and it will work, and it's quite stable. Um, but its main purpose, certainly within my demo, is as a debugging tool. So I can go into the standalone, run it on my own machine, debug the methods. Uh, but the ultimate aim of doing that is to produce a module for an existing HTTP server. I, I just like to let... Uh, service which are built for that job do that job uh, and then you know just plug in my code in the middle so. and that's something I've done in the past is I will in my project group I'll add a, a SAPI module project and then remove everything from it and then add the parts from the standalone one so that they both build the same one build one builds in a SAPI or an Apache module the other builds a standalone and so I use the standalone for debugging purposes and then ready to deploy, she's the other one. And that's that's exactly what I, I did in the, the session there was to you know have a project group with a an Izapi module and a uh, standalone service. I, I did show building the Izapi, I didn't show installing and using it um, because I wanted to focus on implementing the methods in the actual uh, standalone. But everything that we did to that standalone server, uh, when you do a rebuild, will be applied to the Izapi as well. Yeah. And um, all you need to do is point your client at the uh, the location of the is happy instead of the standalone, and it'll it'll work the same way. Uh, let's see. Why does the T REST response not have the content stream property like the I HTTP response interface does? Uh, it it does. It's just named differently. It's the body. Uh, property. You can go in there and read the body of the request. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so there's still a little confusion here about whether or not this is based on Indy or not, or does it have to be based on Indy? 
Um, it's not based on indie. Um, we're building certainly. I, I, I'm not certain with the standalone. I'm pretty sure it's not based on indie. I, I think it's been uh, replaced now with the native TCP client. Um, but certainly, when you're building for an Izapi or uh, an Apache module, then there's no indie involved. So. Yeah, and the client side. The REST client was originally based on Indy, but then as of XE8, it uses the native platform sockets. Right. So you don't have to deploy the OpenSSL to handle the compression, decompression anymore. Uh, does this work on the professional, or do you have to have Enterprise Edition? Uh, this does work on professional, and the REST classes, I think, were introduced in XE6. Uh, Web Broker has been in this since ball and versions. Uh, so it'll work on just about any edition and uh, most versions. So there's a question here about DataSnap, which we're not covering today, but is tangentially related because it's uh, similar uh, in what you're trying to accomplish here, but about DataSnap improvements from XC7 to Seattle, as far as uh, are you aware of anything in there that would justify needing to upgrade? I uh, wonder if you have anything on that, Jim. Well, I know that there was, there's been bug fixes, and they also they switched DataSnap as well to use the native HTTP as well, so that is a performance improvement. Right. Um, it seems like there was some other stuff in there, but I know, cause I know that's one of the things we frequently get asked, and it seems like I remember seeing there was some other uh, enhancements and improvements, but those are the two big ones I can think of off the top of my head. 